Knowledge Products presents The Giants of Philosophy, Plato, narrated by Charlton Heston. Part 2. We turn first, then, to Plato's ethical theory. In Plato's own thought, no more important starting point for understanding ethics could be found than by beginning with the life of Socrates. Here, Plato finds a justification for philosophy and an ethical ideal to which all students of philosophy might aspire. Since Socrates' life serves as an ideal, Plato insists on writing about Socrates himself in the writings which bear most directly on ethics. He does this in a sequence of three dialogues, called the Apology, the Crito, and the Phaedo, which describe the trial, the imprisonment, and finally the execution of Socrates. These three dialogues are based on the events at the end of Socrates' life, but they're probably not strict historical records. The statements attributed to Socrates undoubtedly resemble what he actually said. Even if we can't be certain about this, though, we can be certain about the ethical commitment shown in Socrates' trial and death. We can be certain about the connection revealed here between the ethical decisions and the use of reason. Here, too, we find Socrates' famous statement, as compelling as it is brief. The unexamined life is not worth living. These words spoken at a time when Socrates' own life was at stake, demonstrate how powerful the role of reason was for both Socrates and Plato, not only for theoretical questions, but for the practical question of how one, anyone, ought to live. In the Apology, Plato presents a version of Socrates' speech as he defends himself at his trial. The jury of 500 Athenians, selected by Lot, have heard the charges against him. He's accused of corrupting the young people among his followers and of impiety against the Athenian gods. It's evident that behind these charges, perhaps even more important than the charges themselves, there was a sharp personal animosity against a man who had often challenged and embarrassed the leading figures of Athens. Political leaders in the polis had claimed to rule for the good of the people, but in fact they served their own interests. Poets exerted a strong influence on popular beliefs, but they didn't always understand or believe what they themselves said. Rhetoricians and other teachers, known as the sophists, professed to be able to teach anyone to succeed at anything, whether it was worth doing or not. All of these people had been challenged by Socrates, in a relatively small community where anything interesting was soon known by everyone. It's not surprising, then, that an attempt would be made to silence Socrates. When he speaks in his own defense, Socrates attempts first to explain the antagonism that led to his trial. He does this by relating an episode that involves the Oracle of Delphi, a religious figure revered by the Greeks for her wisdom. Chirophon, a friend of Socrates, had traveled to Delphi to ask the Oracle whether she knew anyone wiser than Socrates. The Oracle replied that indeed no one was wiser. When this statement was reported to Socrates, he tells the jury, he was puzzled. On the one hand, he didn't consider himself wise. On the other hand, the oracle would not be mistaken. In order to determine what the oracle meant, Socrates began then to talk to other Athenians, to ask them questions about themselves and about their work. In these discussions, Socrates discovered that the people he spoke to, the politicians, the poets, the teachers, were far from being the authorities they were supposed to be. They didn't, in fact, know what they claimed to know, and Socrates concluded that this undoubtedly was the basis for what the oracle had said. Socrates believed he did not possess knowledge or wisdom, and in this respect he was just like many other Athenians. But he was wiser than they were in another respect. Socrates knew that he didn't know, whereas they thought they had knowledge when they did not. I gave a thorough examination to this person, I need not mention his name, and in conversation with him I formed the impression that although in many people's opinion, and especially in his own, he appeared to be wise, in fact, he was not. Then, when I began to try to show him that he only thought he was wise and was not really so, my efforts were resented both by him and by many of the other people present. However, I reflected as I walked away, well, I am certainly wiser than this man. 
It is only too likely that neither of us has any knowledge to boast of. But he thinks that he knows something which he does not know. Whereas I am quite conscious of my ignorance. This profession of ignorance by Socrates has since become known as Socratic irony. In it, ignorance too becomes an object of knowledge. But Socrates' irony is more than only a manner of speaking or of showing up his opponents. Ignorance by itself, for Socrates, is not necessarily harmful. Ignorance becomes harmful when a person's not aware that he lacks knowledge. The ignorant person then has no reason to examine himself and to learn. Knowing that one doesn't know is a form of wisdom, and Socrates claims this wisdom for himself. Of course, in repeating this claim at his trial, Socrates could only add insult to injury. It surely didn't help his cause. But the method he uses at his trial is the only one he knows. He speaks the truth and directs it to the people who most need to hear it. Socrates tells the jury, I am not arguing in my own defense but rather in yours, since you will not easily find someone else who, like me, clings to the state as a sort of gadfly. Nor is Socrates willing to change his opinions or his method because of the possible consequences of what he says. To do this would be to repeat the mistake of not recognizing one's own ignorance. Even to fear death, my friends, is also to think ourselves wise without really being wise. For it is to think that we know what we do not know. Socrates' honesty and consistency were not enough to convince his jury. As Socrates himself points out, the vote against him is surprisingly close, 280 to 221. The 501st vote was, by custom, attributed to the goddess Athena, always in favor of acquittal. But the jury's first verdict was not the end of the matter. A second vote was required to determine Socrates' punishment. In ancient Athens, a defendant was permitted to suggest an alternate punishment to the one proposed by his accusers. The jury would then choose between the two. In his case, Socrates' accusers sought the penalty of death. Here Socrates faces a dilemma. If he proposes a real punishment, he would be accepting the jury's verdict. But his view of that verdict is no different from before. He considers himself guilty of nothing more than attempting to educate the people he encountered, of trying to enable them to know themselves. He'd carried on this work, what's more, with no profit to himself. Unlike other teachers, then and now, Socrates didn't accept fees for his instruction. Knowledge is not something he believes that should be bought and sold. In any event, he doesn't think of himself as having knowledge, except for the knowledge that he does not know. So Socrates asks the jury, What is it that would be proper for me to pay? For neglecting what most people care about? Money-making and housekeeping and military appointments? For trying to persuade each one of you how he could become most good and most wise before he took care of any of his interests. What do I deserve since I am such as that? And then he answers his own question. Something good, gentlemen if I am to say what it ought to be in truth. And further, something good which would be suitable for me. So, this is my estimate of the just penalty according to what I deserve. Free board in the town hall. Socrates points out that this was the reward usually given to the winners of prizes at the Olympic Games. It must have been as obvious to Socrates as it is to us now that this proposal would not win over his jurors. For them, it was important that he should admit his guilt. At the very least, they wanted to humiliate him. 
Even when Socrates, at the urging of his friends, adds that he would be willing to pay a small fine, it's too little and too late. The jury is forced to choose between the punishment of death and the strange combination of punishments proposed by Socrates. Faced with this, the jury sentences Socrates to death. So, even when he confronts the prospect of the death penalty, Socrates doesn't compromise. He once again reminds the jury after they reach their decision about his reason for this refusal. The difficult thing is not to escape death, but to escape wickedness. And now I, being slow and old, have been caught by the slower one. But my accusers, being clever and quick, have been caught by the swifter one. Evil. He concludes his speech at the trial with a last wish. One thing only I ask my accusers. Punish my sons, gentlemen, when they grow up. Give them the same pain I gave you. If you think they care for money or anything else before virtue. And if they have the reputation of being something when they are not, reproach them as I reproach you, that they do not care for what they should. On that note, the trial of Socrates and the dialogue called the Apology comes to an end. But the account of what happens to Socrates after the trial continues in the second dialogue of the trilogy. The second dialogue is named the Crito, after a friend of Socrates who appears in it. At the opening of the Crito, Socrates is in prison. Crito informs him that a ship which has been sent on a sacred mission from Athens is expected to return the next day. While the ship's away, no executions can be carried out. But the news of its return means that time is running out. Crito tells Socrates of a plan. He and other friends have raised enough money to bribe the jailers to allow Socrates to escape. Crito tells him that many cities would welcome him if he were willing to leave Athens. Surely he shouldn't sacrifice his life needlessly. By allowing Athens to carry out the death sentence, Socrates would be contributing to a miscarriage of justice. At the same time, he'd be abandoning his friends and his family. So Crito urges Socrates. There, Socrates. If you aren't careful, besides your suffering, there will be all this disgrace for you and us to bear. Come, make up your mind. Oh, really, it's too late for that now. You ought to have made it up already. There is no alternative. The whole thing must be carried out this coming night. If we lose any more time, it can't be done. It will be too late. I appeal to you, Socrates. Take my advice and don't be unreasonable. Crito's words of counsel seem compelling, and there's reason to believe that even Socrates' enemies half expected him to escape. But here, as always, Socrates finds questions to ask, questions which undermine Crito's argument and which, in Socrates' view, Crito is ignored. What's at stake is not only Socrates' life, but certain basic principles. So Socrates reminds Crito, We must value most, not living, but living well. And we must then first examine whether we shall be doing right in paying money to those who will get me out of this, or whether we shall be doing wrong. We must not, after all, do wrong in return, or do evil to anyone in the world, however we may be treated by them. Socrates wonders whether justice would be served by his escape. And here his objections to Crito's plan begin to emerge. Crito has failed to consider a crucial question about the relation between the individual and the state. This relation imposes heavy obligations on the citizens, Socrates points out. These obligations are evident in the similarity between the laws of a country and one's parents. By means of the laws, Socrates suggests, 
people are educated and receive their values. Like a parent, then, the state is responsible for the moral character of its citizens, for the people they become. By escaping from prison, Socrates would be rejecting those laws, much as if he were to attack his own parents because he disagreed with the decision they made. By agreeing to escape, Socrates would be denying more than the verdict. He'd be rebelling against all the laws of Athens, against the authority of the state, and in effect, against the state itself. At the very least, he'd be claiming that the state had no right to judge him. And Socrates' response to this is clear. Violence is not allowed against mother or father, much less against your country. Socrates calls to Crito's attention a second and even stronger objection. A man's free to leave his country at any time. If he chooses not to leave but to remain, he in effect signs a contract with the country to obey its laws. It would be wrong for him to break this agreement just because he sometimes objects to a particular law. This is all the more true if it's not a law he finds fault with, but a person or group of people who misapply the law. Socrates claims that this is indeed what's occurred at his trial. He's been wronged not by the laws, but by human beings. For him to act as if the laws or the state were culpable, then, would itself be an injustice. Socrates imagines what the laws themselves would say if they could speak. Now, Socrates, what are you proposing to do? Can you deny that by this act which you are contemplating... You intend, so far as you have the power, to destroy us, the laws, and the whole state as well. Do you imagine that a city can continue to exist and not be turned upside down if the legal judgments which are pronounced in it have no force, but are nullified and destroyed by private persons? With this conclusion, Socrates rejects Crito's proposal. Crito himself concedes that there's nothing more to say. Socrates doesn't claim here that everything a state or country commands a citizen to do is just. He's not even saying that he himself would obey every law or decision adopted by Athens. Socrates had made clear earlier at his trial that if a jury told him he could continue to live in Athens if he changed his way of life, if he stopped his questioning, for example he would not agree to this. He would go on doing exactly what his conscience told him to. The state, with all its power, couldn't force him to stop doing what he thought was right. But although Socrates might disobey that particular decision or law, he wouldn't even then be rejecting the state as a whole. He'd do what he felt he had to do on the grounds of reason and conscience. The state, on the other hand, would do what it chose to do, and this included executing Socrates. In taking this position, Socrates presents the first known defense of the principle of civil disobedience. A citizen chooses to disobey a law or decree of the government, but he does this publicly and agrees to accept the state's punishment for breaking the law. Civil disobedience forces the state to re-examine its own conscience. It demonstrates to the state how serious the consequences of its policies are. If the government changes its policies as a result of this act, so much the better. Even if it doesn't, the man who commits civil disobedience remains true both to his conscience and to the state. Here too then, Socrates appears in the role of teacher. On the one hand, he claims the right to disobey a law on the grounds of conscience. On the other hand, he would commit this act of disobedience publicly, with no attempt to conceal it or to avoid the consequences. He accepts the right of the state to judge him for breaking its laws. Having reached this conclusion, Socrates could hardly then attempt to escape the punishment that Athens had set for him. So he awaits that punishment patiently. In making this decision, he recognizes the claims of his own principles and of the laws as well. This is the end of Part 2. Please download Part 3 to continue.